Hey guys, it's Blockchain Brad, and today I'm very honored to have Josh Fraser on the channel. He is one of the key members of Origin Protocol, and we've spoken once before. This is designed entirely as a free update. Thanks, Josh, for your time. I really appreciate learning more about what you're up to. Thanks for having me back on again. It's great to reconnect. I know we talked early last year, uh, and it's good to be back. Absolutely, mate. Now, obviously, you're all about trying to provide a decentralized marketplace almost like trying to really bring to the fore what can be done in a de decentralized frame for something like eBay or even beyond that with Airbnb and the like. Tell us exactly you know, what's been happening lately with regard to Origin Protocol um, and, and really what you stand for, Josh. Yeah, so since we last talked, we made a ton of progress. Um, one of the biggest areas we've made uh, progress is on our team. Uh, we've hired one of the most stacked teams in all of crypto. Uh, so my co-founder, Matt, was an early employee at YouTube, as you may remember. I remember. Uh, he was third, third product manager there and 25th employee. Uh, and so when he was at YouTube, he uh, worked alongside these amazing engineers there. Now, one of them was Yupan, who was uh, the first engineer hired at YouTube. Uh, and he also uh, was one of the six guys who started PayPal back in the day. Uh, wow. So since we last talked, Upan came mm -hmm. and joined us on the team. Um, so uh, after that, we were able to bring on a lot of his friends, other people who were in the first 10 employees at, at YouTube and at PayPal. Uh, and so we brought over a bunch of these super senior engineers um, with this incredible experience of scaling uh, companies to you know tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're really, really lucky in that front. We brought on uh, Kuhn, who is um, not only at PayPal and YouTube, but also uh, head of engineering at Dropbox for a while. Uh, so we just have some incredible talent. Um, we've also successfully launched on Mainnet. So uh, we were, you know, pushing for that last time we talked on, you know, get it working on a product. Yes, I noticed the advertising. I think, was it October that you released the Mainnet? Yeah, we went to uh, Mainnet on October. Mm -hmm. um, and so since then, you know, just trying to get people to check that out for, for your viewers who want to see that uh, as live, you can go to our website, originprotocol.com. We'll kick you over to the DAP and let you uh, try that out. But whole idea is being able to buy and sell with other people without any intermediary at all. Being Absolutely. able to directly uh, connect with other, other people and cut out that middleman. Right. Go. Well, let's talk about that a bit more. And I do apologize for not addressing this early. Normally, I like to allow the audience who perhaps don't know about Origin to really get an insight into what you stand for. Mm -hmm. So let's hop back again to the marketplace, Josh. Why the marketplace? Why do you centralize? Why do we need it? What's the benefit? Yeah. yeah, there's four big reasons why we think this is important and meaningful for the world. Uh, the first is really obvious. It's we can cut out the fees. Um, that centralized marketplaces collect. So Uber, Airbnb, all these companies are great. We've all changed our lives. We use them on a regular basis. Uh, but they take 20, 30% out of every single transaction. And when you look at a lot of these marketplaces, the primary service they're providing is just an introduction between a buyer and a seller. Uh, and what we believe is that we can use the blockchain as that digital town square for buyers and sellers to find each other we can cut out those fees all together and both the buyer and the seller can get a better deal um, by cutting out the middleman. Right. Secondly, we've seen the single point of failure that happens when you have a centralized company uh, sitting in between all your transactions. Um, we've seen the impact of this in, in cities like Tokyo where 40,000 listings disappeared from Airbnb overnight mm -hmm. because of new regulations that were passed by the government. Similar thing happened even here in San Francisco, Airbnb's home city. Um, thousands of listings disappeared overnight due to new laws and regulations that were put in place. Same things happened with Uber, which is banned in London, Vancouver, banned in Austin, Texas for a while. Cities all over the world have, have been restricting this and banning these services. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's countless more examples of restricted goods and services uh, uh, all over the place. And so... While we can't change the local laws, we can remove that single point of failure where, you, where it's impossible to come in and shut down that many sellers at one fell swoop. I see. Well, let's talk about that, though, in the context sure. of top-down control, though, Josh. 
because obviously there is, as you've alluded to with the um, evidence in Vancouver and in London, the, the governments in power can actually enact you know, legislation or make a decree that they, uh, certain parties and certain businesses cannot operate in those regions. Are you concerned at all about that kind of top-down pressure? So I think we're, um, uh, that we're certainly, we, we encourage our users to respect our local laws and, and, you know, those laws are, are certainly there for a reason. You know, our view on it is we want to maximize personal liberty as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we want to empower individuals to make their own decisions uh, and, and to be able to, um, you know, sometimes we, you know, I think part of what we realize is a lot of times the government regulations sometimes lag behind innovation. And sometimes the role of uh, the innovators is to sort of push the boundaries a little bit and sometimes the laws and regulations are a little slow in catching up. Sure, I think that's a really good response. But what about enterprise in that sense, Josh? Obviously, with innovation comes enterprise interest. Are you also engaging in that domain aside from the grassroots movement that you're creating for the users and the people? Are you going to work with businesses you know, that can interact in this marketplace? Yeah, so first and foremost, we're, we're, we're developers, we're writing software. Um, you know, we're not trying to run these marketplaces ourselves per se. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to create the tools for other people to create them, right? Um, you can think of it a little bit like we're trying to create this protocol to democratize all of these marketplaces. Uh, we want to make uh, buying and selling on a marketplace more akin to sending an email. Um, that isn't, a, you know, it's just a protocol that isn't under controlled by anyone. Sure, it's, uh, almost, so it's kind of, almost like the protocol for the new DBay rather than eBay. Exactly right. We're not we're not trying to be uh, a replacement for eBay per se. We want to create a pro, you know a protocol for anyone who has something to buy or sell uh, to find each other. Right. Um, so the way we're approaching it is first and foremost coming after um, building tools for developers and for marketplace creators. So if you want to create your own decentralized marketplace, whether that is an eBay like replacement or uh, sharing economy type marketplace or gig marketplace. Um, all of those types of things are possible mm -hmm. uh, and you can use our tools and services to be able to do that. Right. Um, and well, so, yeah, certainly businesses are, are a big part of our strategy. How do we find those businesses that want to run their own marketplaces and how do we empower them to do that? Right. Well, you mentioned the sharing economy. Can you talk us through that terminology? What does it actually mean with regard to both sharing transactions and also sharing economy for the real world? Yeah, so we've seen uh, these are brands that, that people know very well, whether it's Uber or Grab or DD um, or Airbnb. Um, these companies that allow you to take um, surplus inventory of whatever you have, whether it's a spare bedroom or um, you know, maybe you have a, a car that's not being used, you can rent it out by the hour, or um, it's, it's allowing people to resell fractional usage of the assets or their own time. Mm -hmm. um, and so these, you know, we have all sorts of different marketplaces now. You can, you know, on my phone today, I've got dozens of apps to, you know, order anything from a hamburger to a massage uh, on demand. And all of this is sort of what people call as a sharing economy. And all of these companies have middlemen, marketplaces sitting in between that take a cut for making the introduction between the two people at the right time. Right. Um, you can use Wive.com if I want someone to walk my dog for me, but they take 40% out of every transaction when all they're doing is, is just making that introduction. I see. Um, and there's billions, you know, one thing that's really interesting here is uh, the billions of people on this planet who aren't able to use decentralized services for the simple reason that they don't have a bank account or a credit card. Uh, and that's a prerequisite for most of these centralized applications that exist. Right, today. so you're opening so up doors. Huge yeah, huge opportunity to go after these new, uh, people who have never had the chance to interact in a digital marketplace of any kind before. Uh, and for billions of people, we expect the very first digital marketplace they'll ever experience will be peer-to-peer -peer built on something like Origin. Right. Well, let's talk about some of the key assets with regard to you building this sharing economy. You reference things like lower transaction fees um, and, you know, promoting e-commerce. So talk us through some of the value points of building this out. 
Yeah, so four of the developers are building on top of us. Um, you know, we, you can get to market a lot faster than if you were to go at this alone. Um, so if you're thinking about creating your own marketplace, you can, um, you know, most people don't have the engineering talent that we have here uh, in our office, and, and you can use a lot of our, our talent to get to, to market a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. um, you, we, we can also promote and, and help market uh, your marketplace. So, you know, our community is now, you know, well over 100,000 people strong. Uh, and we're, we're successful when our partners are successful. Uh, and so we take, you know, we are going to promote and, and do everything we can to help uh, the marketplaces that are running on top of Origin be successful. Right. Uh, and lastly, there's a, and there's a shared network effect where uh, on, on my phone today, I have all these different apps with different usernames and passwords for each of these apps. And none of, none of the data flows between the different apps. Okay. Um, and so it means that every application has to build their own network effect. Um, but in this new world, on the blockchain, where everything is public by default, uh, we can actually have a shared network effect where every user on one marketplace is already an, a user on the other marketplaces and ready to go. I see. So in a lot so, of ways, like, so it's almost like ahead. bridging those silos, as you've referenced. Clearly, you want to try and create this uh, holistic design so people can interact seamlessly from one marketplace to another. You got it. That's exactly right. You can think of it a little bit like Facebook Connect and how easy it makes you things for you to sign into different websites um, with one username and password everywhere, um, except there's no centralized company holding your data. Uh, you, you know, instead it's all, you know, your data and you have some right. control. Well, can we talk, Josh, about the benefits though for Origin Protocol for those onboarding or utilizing and developing their marketplaces using your protocol? Are there costs involved for them? Is that part of your revenue um, generation? Is that the way that you make money? So we haven't focused or prioritized the revenue for the company at all uh, to date. Um, and I'm thinking maybe this is just a, a Silicon Valley attitude towards us, but um, first and foremost, we're focused on solving real problems for real people. And we really believe that if we are successful in even 1% of our, our mission, there will be plenty of financial upside for us uh, along the way. Okay. Right? So first and foremost, we're focusing on uh, can we build something that millions of, that is going to improve the lives for millions of people? If we don't do that, then we're never going to make money anyway. So we might as well focus on that first. Mm -hmm. um, we are, however, I mean, we have plenty of ideas on, on what we can do. Um, there's plenty of multi-billion dollar companies that are open source um, that make money in various ways, um, often services or add, you know, support or other add-ons like that. Um, and then, of course, we're betting on token economics and this whole idea of um, the token being worth something. Right. Uh, and, uh, more people use it, uh, that, may, that token may appreciate value. And we will, and we will talk Honestly. about that in detail. I really want to get wrap, I really want to understand more the correlation between utility and the business nature of it. But for now, I want to sure. ask you about the listing itself uh, with regard to the number. So already, you know, you've got the mainnet operational since October. You've been known in the space for some time. What's the interest like? How many uh, parties are currently utilizing your protocol and building out? their their interests and, and, and business yeah so it's yeah so it's it's still very uh early days for us so while we're on mainnet um you know we, we have hundreds of users uh that should be thousands or tens of thousands or hopefully millions but uh it's still very early uh for mm -hmm. us um one of our big focuses this year is how you know how do we remove the frictions that are um stopping you know people from using us how do we make it more streamlined and easier to use um and how do we how do we solve real problems? Um, you know, what are the real pain points that we can address with a decentralized marketplace that isn't solved with the existing centralized marketplaces today? Right. Um, and, and Josh, so why we, do you think it hasn't been uh, more rapid, this uh, adoption of something like you? Is it, is it arguably because many of the people involved in, you know, in typical business operations don't really know the narrative of decentralization versus decentralization? Is it because the actual protocols themselves aren't really visible to the average person? What's the reasoning behind why there's a slower, a slow and steady approach to adoption of something like Origin Protocol? Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of reasons, some of which are in our control and some of which are, are more macro. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think in general, this technology is still really nascent. It's really early. Um, there's a lot of user friction on how you acquire cryptocurrency to begin with. Um, a lot of understanding and need, education needs to happen on you know, how to safely store your private keys and what that even means. There's a lot of new paradigms that users have to, to understand before we can even get started. Um, there's a lot of the tooling around it is very immature. You know, we're asking our users to you know, use MetaMask to, to perform transactions and to sign blobs of text that they might not understand what that is or why we're doing it. Um, and so there's a, there's a huge sort of hurdle there of how do we um, make this so that we can, you know, make this usable for millions of, of people around the world, right? Right. Um, and so there's multiple things that have to happen. You know, some of it is a shared effort with other projects in the space that are also um, working to, you know, we've got uh, lots of exchanges which are working to, you know, ease the on ramps and making it easier to, to purchase cryptocurrency. We have other people helping with the education around this stuff. Um, but it's a, some of it's a shared task and some of it is, you know, up to us to always be, you know, out there um, and telling the world about why this matters and why this is important and meaningful for the world. Sure. And Josh, thanks for that explanation. Let's talk about, though, the token itself. I was going to leave this to later, but we are almost discussing it now. Now, you have a utility token by design. I want to talk about your response to how you can explain to the people that your utility token from the outset is a utility, given that most of them function as securities. Most people jump in and they invest uh, because they want to see some sort of growth in that value because of the work that you do follows along the Howey test. Now, clearly, as you move out, you want it to be that genuine utility. How do we actually get to that phase, though? So we, the way we think about our, our token, first and foremost, is an incentive system. This, I mean, this was a lesson of Bitcoin uh, in the beginning. This is really a lesson of incentives and how you design the right incentives and how incentives drive behavior. And that's what we've seen uh, carried out with, with Bitcoin and Ethereum and all of these um, uh, successful blockchains. For us, the question is how, what are the incentives that we want on our marketplace and how can we use them to drive the behaviors and the outcomes that we want? So one of our fears is what if Origin becomes this place where all of the listings on our marketplace are just scams, right? Or bad, like just bad, fake. Mm -hmm. um, and can I just jump in and some, add to that? What if some of the investors themselves are scams as well, where they just utilize, <laughs> you know, your platform as a way to cash out through a pump and dump? We've seen that yeah, happen well, with different companies well, too. Yeah, well, let, let's, let's come back to that, to that question separately. Okay. Um, for, we're now like, the question is, how do, we, how do we create the right incentives for the behaviors we want on the platform, right? Mm -hmm. Disincentivizing bad actors, making sure there's not bad listings. We have some sort of mechanism to prevent um, you know, some sort of quality control on that. And more importantly, how do we encourage the good behaviors that we want? How do we encourage people to, to per make purchases, leave reviews? Most important thing for any network is for it to grow. So how do we incentivize people to invite their friends and mm -hmm. uh, reward them for helping the network uh, be successful? So at a high level, that's how we think about our, the purpose of our token and how it operates. Much like the the purpose of you know ETH and the Ethereum uh, uh, network um, as an incentive mechanism to, to drive the behavior that you want. Um, to today, um, when we started looking at who are the different people we need to incentivize, we have all these different actors: the buyer, and the seller, the marketplace operator, the token holders. Uh, we wanted to start with the marketplace operators because those were the first people we're going after, asking them to participate in our network. And so what we're offering, um, the use of our token today, is an incentive mechanism for those marketplace operators. So anyone who's listening who's interested in creating their own marketplace, uh, you can actually earn origin tokens uh, by running this marketplace. People who post listings on the marketplace can offer an optional commission. So again, there's no fees to post on the origin network, but you can choose to boost your listing, is wow. what we're calling it. Uh, and that that goes 100% of that goes to the marketplace operator uh, and it gives them an incentive to help feature your listing or promote it. Maybe they'll run ads for you on your behalf uh, because that's the money that they uh, are guaranteed to get 
if they're you know if they help facilitate that final sale uh, of your listing. So this right. is a very sort of tried and true business model. Um, sort of affiliate model is is very sort of well understood. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also is like really important for us to have some incentive to the people we're asking to spin up these marketplaces. Um, we have, you know, it comes with a pre-baked business model. So there's an easy way for you to start making money on it from day one. Right. Well, talk us through the actual utility though for, as you said, you're breaking the, really bridging those silos and making this a really robust system. But fundamentally, if people are going to utilize the token, is it designed to be something as a, a means of a currency fundamentally or internally, or is it actually meant to be what the the interest of VCs tend to be, and that's that SOV, so they can see it really grow in value for investment reasons. Is there, or is it both? So we're really looking at it as the incentive mechanism to keep the network healthy and growing, right? So um, we're actually not using it as a payment token. The payment on our platform today is really about Ethereum. Um, okay. And so, or, or any ERC20 compatible token um, can be used as well. So, you know, when we actually think about it, stable coins are maybe a more interesting way of doing payment uh, mm-hmm. than Ethereum, uh, particularly when you start introducing time into the equation. Uh, if I'm, I'm booking a spare room in your house uh, from two months from now, uh, I don't know if the price right. of Ethereum is going to double or, or drop in half, but it's not going to be what it is today. That's yes, we are we are used to the fiat world, so we appreciate what you're saying because that's what everyone's been asking as well, Josh, is how on earth can we trust the volatility of the market knowing that we want to buy bread this week, but next week it costs us the price of two loaves. Sure. And we're seeing this right now on our platform with people who posted listings you know, a few months ago. Uh, and now everything's on sale at, at quite a, a, a steep discount. Mm. Uh, and so obviously, um, you know, that's problematic for some of our sellers who weren't, you know, planning to, you know, sort of account for that. Sure. So incentivization is the buzzword for the value of your utility, which makes a lot of sense. Now let's hop back to your, your platform and unpack some of the value points and the features. You are an end-to-end design. Uh, Talk us through things like your log management, your dashboarding, your alerting, your application performance, your monitoring. Why are these features important to design? So we're focusing, most of our deliverables are really just JavaScript that runs in the browser. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we don't have a lot of the, you know, our stack um, is a truly decentralized stack. We don't have a lot of the stuff that you would have in a more traditional um, type application. Uh, and, and that is important because it gives you that decentralization. So um, we give you a JavaScript library, uh, which is talking directly to the blockchain and is fetching the, the content it needs directly from IPFS. And so that means that we're not sitting in between on those transactions. We're not the single point of failure. Uh, mm-hmm. You're talking directly to the blockchain, right? So shutting down, you know, we're, we're giving you a marketplace that no one, including us, uh, can shut down. Uh, sure. And so that's really interesting from a, um, a censorship resistance type perspective. Sure. Now, what about with uh, things like KYC AML? I'm hearing the narrative from you that's reminiscent of BTC in the sense of immutability and transparency, but what about uh, means of identity and identification and record keeping? Yeah, so we're, um, we, identity is such an important aspect um, for a lot of the things that we want to build uh, at Origin. You have to have a solid foundation of identity um, because how else are you going to trust, have that trust for transacting with anonymous strangers on the internet? Exactly. Uh, if you have a solid foundation of identity, um, a lot of other things um, really rely on that, whether it's, you know, messaging or arbitration or um, say a jury system or insurance, all of these things sort of require that you know who the other person is on the other side, that they're real, uh, there is only one of them and not like 20 clones of them running around. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we're spending a lot of time and a lot of our work over the last year has been focused on building that foundation of a really solid identity platform. Uh, and the way we're doing it is in, in a decentralized way where you can have attestations from trusted third parties 
who can verify different pieces of information for you, whether that's your driver's license, your phone number, your email address. Some of these things are digitally verifiable, like I can uh, text your code, and then if you can type that code in, then it's clear that you have control of that phone number. Okay. Um, other things require like human uh, verification, so looking at your driver's license or passport or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but all of those attestations can get signed by these trusted parties, handed back to you, you can publish them on the blockchain, and now you can start building up this reputation across all these different marketplaces, the shared data layer we were talking about. Now you've got that reputation that can be built up across all these different platforms, and now you have a much better understanding of who this person is and whether you can trust them in this particular instance in this transaction that you're a part of. Right, and what about the, the aspect of choice as well, Josh? What kind of choice does the user have to um, um, interact in this way? I mean, we, I was talking to you pre-interview about certain protocols coming forth where they really are bringing the choice of how private you want, really want to be. In, in your design, is there choice inbound in, in how much I can, how much so I absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So um, you, you have a couple of choices. One, you can remain just anonymous. You can, you can just be zero X, one, two, three, you know, whatever, like you can be just known, but buy your Ethereum wallet. Um, and there's nothing at the protocol layer that says you need to ever divulge more than that. Mm -hmm. Um, the question is, well, will other buyers and sellers in the ecosystem accept that? Um, and maybe they will, right? Maybe they're willing to interact with anonymous entities. Mm -hmm. um, that's up to them, right? So that's their choice on whether to, to interact with you. Um, maybe you, um, you know, reveal some of your identity to them in an offline means that, that makes them feel more comfortable. Right. But Josh, um, I just want to jump in. You can in. also have multiple, yeah, sure. So I just want to jump in there and ask you, you know, what your thoughts are, given what you're saying about the Silk Road. Because that would have led a found, certainly laid a foundation of a very different type typology, something that I would imagine you're moving away from in every or running from. But you know, certainly the agenda was there to be ultra private, to be you know, immu uh, you know, entirely anonymous. Actually, so what are your thoughts on that? Because you know, the the gearing there was to not so much give people choice, but to ensure privacy. Yeah. So I think we're. Um you know, there's a little bit of, uh, <laughs> what, what, what's funny here is that everything is so public, right? All of these transactions are, we, you know, we keep talking about blockchains as this solution for privacy. Um, and there's some, there's some truth to that and some component of that, but also like every transaction is I've ever made on the blockchain is, is public, right? I mean, people can see what I've been, what I've been up to and what I've been doing. Right. Uh, that's not true with my bank account, right? You can't, you don't know what I've been buying on my, on my bank account, but you could, you could probably figure out my, if you're in wallet and, and, and see what I've been up to there. So I, I think that's, that's quite interesting. Um, you know, I think what we're, we're really pushing for is having this identity layer be really, um, um, the foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think when, what we've seen on, on the internet by and large is that people, are much better behaved when they're acting under their own names uh, and not pseudo names. And so um, I think a lot of um, a lot of problems can be avoided just by having that really rock solid identity layer um, that makes a lot of stuff really traceable and also makes people feel really um, careful about what they're doing. Um, sure. But we're not, you know, we're not, certainly not trying to um you know create any you know go after any particular verticals that would get us in trouble with the government where um we're you know u.s based company and and certainly are trying our best to respect all the laws and regulations here right um, but we are you know from a philosophical standpoint we want to maximize personal liberty as much as possible and um we're just building tools uh we're just developers writing tools to uh, enable um, people to uh, transact directly without any middle one. Right. So let me get this straight. Essentially, yeah. you are going to enfranchise the prospects of trying to, or you're going to establish an identity layer. You're going to make it so that it is seamless and people can uh, ideally try and identify the buyer and the, and, the, and the seller so that things can happen, you know, from A to B without that point of, uh, 
without the middleman trying to get in the way of those intermediaries trying to be expensive and just in many ways obsolete. So if you're doing that, what I did want to ask you is where does the decentralization come in if that's possible? And also, you know, considering that we've already seen things like eBay do the decentralized thing, is the idea that you're going to, as a team, relax and let this just flourish in an organic way at some point so that it can be authentically decentralized or how is it going to actually be truly decentralized? So, yeah, so, you know, our, our deliverable to the world is just open source software that we're writing. Um, how people use that uh, remains to be seen. Um, but that's our, that's our gift and contribution to, to the world. Um, and, it's, and it's decentralized in that when you're using that software, it's talking not to our servers, it's talking to the blockchain, it's talking to IPFS, and you can publish what you want there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, when we think about, you know, how things get, how things get used, we draw a very bright line between origin for protocol, the open source standard, um, and origin for U.S. based company with founders that don't want to go to jail, mm -hmm. right? So for uh, on the protocol side, it wouldn't be effective or, or appropriate for us to apply any sort of censorship. Um, or any sort of controls of what is and isn't allowed there. Um, just like SMTP, the protocol for email, doesn't have anything that stops you from uh, coordinating a, a hit on someone, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or drug, a drug deal, right? There's right. nothing in protocol that prevents that. Sure. Um, that said, if you start, you know, selling drugs out of your Gmail account, mm -hmm. um, you might get a visit from the government um, because there is a company there that is going to be keeping an eye on things. And, and Hopefully. That. So how, how, that, how it applies for us is um, at the protocol layer, there's absolutely no sort of controls or censorship. Uh, when it comes to stuff that's running on our servers, and we'll, we'll certainly have our, our own DAP um, that uh, people are, are able to interact with and buy and sell uh, through our DAP. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Obviously, anything that comes from our servers, we are going to, you know, filter that based on U.S. regulations. Um, we're not going to put anyone in the company in, in risk and in, in legal mm. risk. Um, right. And so, you know, will be, you know, those those results will be filtered. Uh, if you want the unfiltered results, you can grab the source code off of GitHub and you can run it yourself. I see. So really, it's about just making sure there's a, a small degree of oversight there so that you can ensure that there's no illicit practices. But that's going to be tough as you build out. So there's no illicit uh, market marketplaces because oh, as you become bigger, that's going to be hard to monitor. Yeah, and, it, and it's, a, it's a challenge because every, uh, every country and jurisdiction is a little bit different. Mm. Uh, and blockchain doesn't really respect uh, borders and boundaries. So mm. uh, it's, a, it's a tough, tough problem. Um, but one, uh, one for the future. One, one for the future. We need some users first. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about now how you're going to sustain your own model beyond the, you know, the pre-sale uh, support that you've had and, and the plans for the future. How are you going to be viable for the long term if, you know, you're a gift, as you mentioned, a protocol gift for the people? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a, a lot of it comes to uh, back to what we're talking about, or how we're going to make money, and and sort of betting on the uh, we'll, that we'll be able to figure out if we right. solve something that's, that's solving a real problem, right? Um, if if enough people want this, uh, and we're able to displace multi-billion-dollar markets, um, I'm sure there's some opportunities for us there. Um, we are very fortunate to be well funded. We have some of the leading firms. Uh, and cryptocurrency funds like Pantera Capital that invest in us, Foundation Capital here invest in us, um, a bunch of funds out of Asia from FPG and Block Asset and, and Hashed in Korea and, and 1KX in, in Europe. A um, mm. lot of great supporters who, who've invested a lot of, of funding in the, in the company. Um, and so we've raised, you know, $30 million uh, of funding. We have lots of, lots of runway. Um, and so we have a lot of energy. Up. We're, we're, we've got a, a good war chest and um, more importantly, I think we're, you know, just as important as the runway on the financial runways with the motivation and the, the conviction to work on this for as long as it takes. 
So how uh, long have you got? Given the war chests are pretty full right now, what's the uh, time frame for the, uh, the money that you did raise? And did you cash that into fiat so that you do have it? So uh, I'll just say we, um, we have multiple years of, of runway. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, we, we have some exposure to, to crypto, but we were uh, fortunate to have a, a large uh, war chest of fiat as well. Right. Okay. Now we were talking about this before. What about the risks inherent with some of the male actors in the VC space? Even in some of the ones that you've listed there, there's been articles written about some of them. I'm going to name one right now. That's FBG. I'm not saying that they are male actors, but certainly mm -hmm. there's been illusions from different people. So are you concerned at all about the potential of male acting, of jumping, of disrespecting the long-term value of any project from these, uh, you know, the parties that essentially seek profit and nothing more. Sure. One of the, one of the things we did when we were doing our pre-sale uh, was focusing on how we minimize the risk of any one person being able to tank the value of our network. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the ways we did that is we capped allocations on how much our investors were able to, to put in. Um, we started, we started with a million dollar cap that due to the, the crazy demand that we saw on our, our pre-sale, um, that quickly dropped to 500k and then 200k and then even even less than that. Um, and what that meant is that a lot of these these funds actually have relatively small amounts um, of of stake in our company uh, mm -hmm. and in the network. And so, um, you know, while we didn't have any um, reason to believe that there was any bad actors, whatever, we didn't want any one company or entity to be able to you know, wake up in a bad mood and, and tank the price of our, our token. Right. Uh, and so we really worked on how do we distribute it to as many people as possible. Um, another way we did that was on CoinList. We did a sale on, on CoinList um, last, towards the end of last year. And our goal there, again, we capped how much the max contribution uh, per investor, and that time it was only $25,000 was, was the cap we put. And the focus was really on how do we get as many people to be able to participate as possible how do we spread it out um so that we can get it in as many hands as, as possible right and it uh, sounds like the bear possible. market the bear market has been tough but the bull market was good to you in the timing that you did actually raise those funds yeah we were very fortunate um for the timing we had I, you know i like to think that you know good teams and 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 good ideas um can thrive at any time and um mm. you know we're you know the, the bear market is uh, you know, a lot of times we forget it's, it's during a bear market that Amazon and Google and, and a lot of the giants of today really thrived um, mm -hmm. because they had access to um, extra talent that, um, you know, they wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, we're starting to see that now with all of the layoffs in, in crypto and it's, you know, it's unfortunate, mm -hmm. um, but it is a good time for uh, the companies that are still hiring that are still uh, growing. Um, you know, we're, have, we're seeing an influx of more and more developers um, who, are, who are wanting to get to speed in Oregon and looking for full-time jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're talking to lots of great people. And so it's, uh, I think it's, it's important to remember a lot of great tech uh, is built during these bear markets. And it's a huge opportunity for uh, the real builders in the space to really make some progress and, and cement their hold. For sure. And obviously, you know, the future is, is, is positive for you, you know, the way in which the, you're building out your team. But what with the, the way in which people can interact in the token, I'm alluding more to the prospects of a, a public sale or what is the plan beyond the current state of your pre-sale? Talk us through where you're at, what you want to do and, and the access even on exchanges. Yeah, so... Um we haven't announced anything yet. I know it's been, uh, it's, people in our community are probably frustrated that's been our, our answer for so Well, long. you can today, uh, Josh. Bring it on. Announce what you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 what I can say is we want as, uh, we want as many people in our community to have our hands on our token as possible. Um, we, re we really believe in this idea of redistributing a value to the early participants in the network. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had a, I had a ride the other day with a guy. He was... Uh, the 30th driver on Uber, and he's still driving for Uber today. Wow, still paying fees. He's making less money than me. Still, wow. still paying fees, right? Um, but here's the sad thing is when when Uber IPOs for billions of dollars, that guy's not going to see a single penny, even though 
he, you know, the company wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him and his friends who, you know, helped get that network started in the very beginning. Exactly. Uh, and so one of the things that excites me most um, with what we're doing is this chance to incentivize everyone uh, who's a part of our community to use our platform and not only to use our platform, but to go out and invite your friends to use it as well, because um, we want to design systems where we can actually give you origin tokens um, for lots of actions that you provide, that you do on the, on the platform that are beneficial for the network. So sure. we're looking at how do we reward people for uh, using the platform, making purchases, leaving reviews, uh, uploading listings. How do we reward you for inviting your friends? Arguably mm -hmm. the best thing that you could do for any network. How do we make sure that we're giving you origin tokens um, in exchange for some of these. Got things. it. So um, really what you're saying is it's all about building out this network. And if you're a contributor to that, to that ethos and that, that uh, practice, if you're practically, oh, sorry, if you're pragmatically engaged with the ecosystem and you're facilitating the, the expansion, you're likely to be one of those in that next wave of, you know, sale uh, token offerings. That's, that's what I'm hearing from you. That, that's what we're, we're focusing on is who are, you know, whoever people are contributing the value to the network and how do we reward that behavior? And that's one of our big initiatives for this quarter. Um, mm -hmm. So look for some more specific details on how we're going to be rolling that out um, this quarter. So that's, I will. Uh, that's I definitely will, Josh. And let's talk about uh, two really important features that are advertised throughout your social media platforms. And that is editable listings and also this support for multiple items. They're really important to your e-commerce design. Talk us through them. Yeah, so these are things we just launched um, just last week. Um, editable listings because we're human and people make mistakes. Um, interesting uh, thing to build because everything on the blockchain is immutable, right? So, uh, you know, the whole idea of how do you make it um, editable um, so you have multiple versions and it gets more complicated once you um, have to have an arbitrator come in and, and weigh in on a decision. You need to know what the listing looked like at the time of the purchase, not what it was edited to five minutes after the purchase. So there's a few right. little things that are really uh, tricky to think about there. Um, and then, of course, multi-unit uh, is important if you want to run any sort of e-commerce uh, type of application. So now instead of just selling a single unit item uh you can say i want to sell 10 pairs of shoes and the blockchain will actually keep track of how many uh how many shoes are still available and you can actually do inventory uh on the blockchain and so we're doing um uh we're using event sourcing for that which is a really cool way of of doing it in a very uh efficient way uh of calculating how, how many units are still available so we, you know, in, in a lot of ways, these are sort of simple features, things that arguably we should have had a long time ago, mm -hmm. uh, but they unlock this new capabilities that are, are really important for people who want to run e-commerce stores um, and just helps solve some of these pain points uh, that were there on using our, up, you know, our marketplace app. Uh, right. And what's the feedback been like with jo Josh with the interface itself? Eh? How user-friendly is it? people to interact because that's going to be really important when people jump on to real to try and interact with the origin protocol and, and the marketplace more to the point how seamless is it for them and stress-free sure so I, I you know I think um, <laughs> we're, we're, do, we're compared to other dApps um, we're best in class right and when it comes to um, comparing us to other dApps that are out there um, we've really focused hard on making the user experiences as seamless as possible. Um, there's a lot of great work that our, our team has done on the product and, and thinking through the paradigms of how do you communicate all these challenges on the blockchain and explaining to people that, you know, your, your transaction is still finalizing on the blockchain and, you know, there's a certain number, how many confirmations have been like, these are all new concepts to, to throw at people. Um, but I think our, our team has just done an exceptional job at, 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 at tackling these, these really tough UX challenges. Uh, on the other side, if, you've, if it's your first time using a DAP, uh, you're going to look at it and go, what on earth? Why is this so hard? Why is this so confusing? Mm -hmm. uh, we still have a lot of work cut out for us to make it as seamless and, and easy to use 
as the applications that we're all used to using every day that are run by centralized providers. Right. Um, okay. And so we're, you know, this is just the beginning for us. We have a lot of work ahead of us, um, but we're we're pumped up and uh, looking forward to continuing to to do our best. Right. Well, that's really cool. And with regard to that, let's talk security for a moment. One of the things that people uh, have been talking about when they discuss Origin Protocol is the ERC-725. Now, talk us through what exactly that standard's all about. Why is it there and what's it for? So ERC-725 is identity standard proposed by Fabian Fasteller, who was um, creator of the uh, uh, ERC-20 standard, which we all know and love. Mm-hmm. Um, he was also creator of WebVJS and then this browser. Um, he's currently working with the Ethereum project, so very, very well-known guy in the community. Um, last deal. November, he put, big deal, um, put out a proposal last November for how to do identity on the blockchain. Um, but no one had actually built a working implementation of it. Uh, and one of our contributors, um, Nick, um, looked at it and said, oh, this could be useful for Origin. Uh, and actually built the first working implementation of the ERC-725 standard. Um, so we quickly implemented it into our protocol um, mm-hmm. and started playing around with it to see how well it would work for our needs on doing identity. Um, we also created the ERC-725 Alliance, lots of projects that are uh, also interested in, in seeing how we can use this identity standard um, for doing identity on the blockchain. Um, interestingly, we've, we've since, you know, moved to a simpler identity solution on our, okay. our platform. Uh, and the reason is, is that we're moving more and more logic out of the smart contracts and into JavaScript because running operations on chain is really, really expensive. And so, uh, when we it's launched also, our... It's also quite laborious, I would imagine too. Quite well, what we... What, the the user experience, yeah, so the user experience is largely the same um, for users today, but um, when we launched on mainnet, we realized that it would cost $10, roughly $10, to launch your identity profile on chain. And that's just a, a, a non-starter for so many people. Um, it's just too expensive. Um, and so what we, what we realized is a lot of great stuff that ERC-725 provides particularly around on-chain validation of claims. Um, but that's something that we can actually do in JavaScript now. We don't need to do it on-chain because mm-hmm. um, a lot of our other logic is, is at all our, our integrity checks are done in JavaScript instead of on-chain uh, for efficiency. And so we've since moved to a much uh, lighter identity standard that we um, came up with ourselves. Um, and then and in, instead of $10 per identity contract, it costs a penny or two. Right. Um, and well, so that's a, that's the cost difference. is <laughs> quite, quite a difference. So we're, we're still huge supporters of the ERC-725 standard. Uh, mm-hmm. It makes a lot of sense for a lot of other applications that do need that on-chain validation mm-hmm. of those claims. Um, but it just doesn't fit what, what we need right now. So right. And, and Josh, it's really, it's really cool to hear that you are upgrading even on those things that were valuable at the time because that's really also an indicator of good quality technology and good quality teams is that they are constantly uh, reinvigorating and improving and enhancing their own system. I, th- I think that's right. And, um, you know, we're... You know, we're going to continue, right? We'd like la- we'd like to give it down to free, right? There's a huge difference between free and a penny, and so if we can figure out a way to uh, give you your, an identity profile for free without sacrificing the you know the things that are important to us, mm. um, we're going to do that too. Free always works for the people, that's for sure. One thing I did want to talk about was STOs regulation and how you're kind of going to treat. The, uh, the origin protocol internationally given very diff- the variants from China, for example, uh, to the much of the world, to Europe, to the US. How are you going to bridge all these things given that essentially this whole system is borderless? That's a pretty complicated thing from a legal standpoint. Yeah, so I, I think, um, are you referring more to the token and, and doing it on, you know, doing uh, securities laws or more of right. the goods and services that are sold on the platform? Probably both. I mean, we've talked about the goods and services themselves, but yeah, sure. it's, it, the STOs is something that does concern me, considering you're A, a DAP, B, your utility token. 
and see there's complexity everywhere on that front. Oh, sure. So I think there's, um, you know, we're, we're certainly paying a lot of attention to the, the tiny bit of guidance we're getting from the FCC um, on, you know, how we're viewing these things as securities. Mm. You know, we are uh, optimistic. Um, there's lots of uh, recent uh, things that are giving us a lot of optimism that um, the SEC is going to take a, a, a nuanced approach to, um, you know, tokens. And uh, I think one of the things that was really encouraging was seeing them say, um, you can start out as a security and you can become decentralized enough to be not a security. I'm glad um, you mentioned that because I don't think there's enough discussion about the CFTC, which really is where we should be talking because they're the ones represent the commodities. Right. So yeah, I mean, you, you've got, uh, yeah, it's, it's what are tokens? Are, are these securities? Are these commodities? Mm -hmm. are, are they assets? Are, what, what are these things? And I think we need to get to the point where we realize that these are some new category altogether. But yes, right. there are some properties of securities, there are some properties of currencies and commodities, um, but it's a, it's a whole new thing. Uh, and uh, they, they vary from, from use case to use case. And I think the sooner we start treating them as a new category, instead of trying to shoehorn it into an mm. existing category, the better off we're going to be. Really well said, I think there, Josh. And also, it sounds like you're not worried, given that you're already a functional and viable protocol that's being utilized as, as, for a multitude of marketplaces. That already implies utility and uh, you know, commoditization as opposed to a security now. So that, yeah, that's, we're, that's we're, in your favor. We're, yeah, we're, we're represented by, by a top law firm. Uh, we're working with Cooley here as well as Goodwin. Um, we're taking, you know, we're doing everything you say, we're telling us to do it on how to structure things in a, in a legally compliant way. Um, and I think as a team, uh, we're really focused on, we don't want to take unnecessary risk. We want to, you know, we're, we're quite conservative in, in how we approach this stuff and we're very careful um, because, you know, we, we want to do things in, in the right way. Um, you know, there's some uncertainty for, for sure, but that's what makes it fun. We're in a, you know, that's, that's pretty uh, common when you're in a bleeding edge. Uh, mm. Sometimes, you know, it takes a while for laws and regulations to catch up. Absolutely. Um, on, on the utility side, yeah, I think we're, you know, we're building far more um, technology, um, even more, more usage and, and, and more decentralized um, usage than, than most of our companies out there. And so for that, we're, um, we're quite grateful. Right. Now, obviously, it's reasonably experimental given it's so nascent. Uh, and you've mentioned okay. some of the progress you've made technologically, some of the things that are onboarding now. But what's the plan for the next step with regard to, uh, you know, moving beyond in, into this space of expansion, uh, developing the, the technology, the, the network itself? What's the but one thing that makes you excited perhaps for 2019? Uh, the, the big focus for us is on adoption. How do we get more users? Uh, and a lot of that is listening to the users we have, um, getting some of these new features out there. We've got some really exciting stuff coming in the next week, couple of weeks and months, uh, but we're going to be launching um, the market. You know, we're going to be putting a marketplace in the hands of a lot more people. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be listening to their feedback and iterating. Um, you know, we take a, a different approach from a lot of projects that, um, like to sort of get everything perfect and mm -hmm. then ship something. That's that's not how software uh, is made in the real world. Uh, instead, it's an iterative process. You ship regularly. You ship often. Uh, you listen to feedback and you iterate from there. Got it. So, Josh, I need to jump in because something you said has piqued my interest for the people. How are you going to do this, Josh? You alluded to it going into the hands of a lot more people and you stressed that. Talk us through. Are you going to be partnering with platforms that have a huge reach? Um, potentially, that's certainly something that we're, we're excited for. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it starts with the, gr the grassroots efforts uh, of people who are, um, really understand why decentralization matters, why it's interesting for their marketplaces. Um, we're not planning to partner with Uber or Airbnb on, on day one. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, the Ethereum network can't even handle that much traffic for that matter. Um, but instead, we, you know, we are certainly open to 
um, doing some pilots with some some big companies, and we're already in discussions with a lot of big companies um, who are interested in learning more about this technology. We want to do some pilots. Uh, want to understand how blockchain can impact their business. Got it. Um, and, and who knows? You know, and Josh, could be sorry to interrupt again, but what about moving beyond Ethereum as well if you need to? Are you willing to do that? If it require, if it's uh, going to increase the capacity of your own DAP? Sure. So I, I, we get this is probably the most common question we get, which is why are you not building on blank, fill in the name of your favorite alternative chain? Um, and the, and the answer I give is always this, is that um, Ethereum's community is second to none. Uh, and if you look at the transactions per second on Ethereum, um, yes, it's not nearly adequate for um, trying to build like an Uber or a neighboring beer or something like the volume that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but with the exception of a couple days of Crypto Kitty madness and a couple hot ICOs, we haven't fully saturated the available TPS of the Ethereum network today. And so first and foremost, we have to get there, right? Um, we have to, until, none of this matters until we have actual users. Mm -hmm. um, once we have thousands of users who are clamoring to use this thing and are complaining that it's slow, that is a time for us to start thinking about where we go, what alternate ways to, to speed things up and, and optimize things. Sure. Until then, it's I think we're we're focusing on wrong problem everyone's talking about how do we get 10 million transactions per second. It doesn't matter until mm. we have a users until there's user demand there none of that is even relevant sure but i ask you this because perhaps it does in one sense that yes user users is paramount but what if there are problems inherent with ethereum in the future perhaps that's the the direction of some of these sure. concerns are going I, I, are you opening up the opportunity for onboarding on other um, platforms on other other EVMs or virtual machines if you need to. Yeah, what, one of the promising things is that most of these alternate chains are uh, com compatible with the Ethereum EVM. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is if and when we have a reason to switch to an alternate chain, um, it's quite likely quite easy to do that. And actually we've seen prototypes from a lot of these alternate chains that are trying to convince us uh, to, to switch over, running the Origin DAP as a, as a prototype as their sort of test suite uh, mm -hmm. to show how well it, it works. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we, we're able and, and willing to switch to alternate chains uh, if something else is able to, to get that user adoption and, and get that, you know, um, make more progress. Um, one of the nice things about being sort of a meta layer is that the developers are building on top of us won't necessarily need to worry about the ins and outs of the, what changed underneath. Right. So as long as they're coding to Origins libraries, um, we could potentially swap out the entire chain, uh, but everything else would remain exactly the same for them. Sure. And really what I'm hearing from you is that typical um, uh, dev response, and that is that Ethereum for you is a computer, fundamentally. That's, that, has, that computational capacity is paramount to its price. Whereas, you know, in the crypto space, we hear more of the concern of the price and the, the, the decrease, but that's also arguably related to a lot of the, um, the ICO bubble and, you know, the changes that happened in that time. So really, the computational value is still there for Ethereum, arguably. Yeah, and, and there's, there's always trade-offs um, between the decentralization uh, and the performance and the security of it. So mm. um, there's reasonable trade-offs to be made there. Um, but I think what's happening a lot of when I'm hearing pitches from alternate blockchains is they're not being honest about the trade-offs that are being made. They're saying, oh, you can be just as fast or you can be just as secure as Ethereum, but I'm a thousand times faster. Mm. Um, and I haven't heard a, a case that's, that's really that compelling yet. Usually there's trade-offs and, and a lot of times there are reasonable trade-offs to be made uh, where maybe you don't need the security of tens of thousands of nodes verifying a transaction uh, for you to be be safe, right? Maybe a couple hundred would be enough. Mm. Uh, and so there's very reasonable trade-offs to be made there. Um, and, and so, you know, we're open to moving to other chains and, you know, we're, we're you know, rooting for all of these people who are working on these other technologies, um, even though we're sort of ignoring them and focusing on <laughs> user sure. adoption first and foremost. Uh, we do support their efforts and we're, we're excited by the work that we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. We do think it's really important.
Right, I hear what you're saying. So reason, you're reasonably objective with regard to the prospects in the future, but you are a fan of what you would argue is the best uh, underlying platform that is Ethereum for you. Now, let's talk stablecoin for a moment. You alluded to this before. What's the plan for the future in, in how you are going to engage? Uh, my understanding is you currently are engaging with one. Yeah, so we're working with, um, at the smart contract level, actually support any ERC-20 um, compliant token. Um, in our DAP right now, we're just accepting Ethereum. Uh, we're planning on rolling out, you know, support in our UI for um, stable coins this year. So um, probably first half of this year, you'll start seeing some more announcements around that. Mm -hmm. um, lots to figure out on um, which stable coins we should support. Um, should we support all of them? Should we, you know, lots of challenges from a usability standpoint of, you know, do you give users an array of 50, you know, 50 different stable coins and you can choose? Um, mm. What if they're all kind of worth the same, right? Like they're all worth a dollar. Um, can we not just treat them all as the same? So there's lots of sort of usability challenges around that. Um, but it's, you know, we're convinced that um, stable coins are important for, uh, trend, you know, for marketplaces. And there's a lot of people who are probably not transacting on marketplaces today because they don't want to take on that currency risk. Right. Um, particularly if you have, uh, if you have a, a, a real cost uh, associated with delivering a good or service, um, you can't take on that risk of uh, the asset or, uh, dropping in price. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we think it's very important and, um, you know, we're, you know, ho hoping to roll out and planning to roll out support for at least one stable coin, probably multiple stable coins. Um, you know, in a few months. Got it. Okay. So we'll look forward to more of an update later in the year. What about the partnerships though that you've advertised? I've had a look at them. Um, you've got a suite of them. I won't mention them all, but some of them haven't done so well for themselves. I wanted to find out what's that reciprocal relationship with these business partners that you've engaged with? What was the point of them? So, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, it's a shame um, that uh, a lot of, you know, some projects made it, some didn't. I think it's mm. very true of, uh, startups in general, um, and uh, probably even more true in the crypto space, given the hype and the uh, and the the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, craze we saw last year. Um, you know, I, I despite the ones that that um, have maybe not done so well, um, you know, we are still really optimistic about some of them that are are continuing to to make good progress. Some of them more quietly. Um, and there's also new people who maybe haven't been announced but are now in, in conversations. I think the way we're thinking about partnerships has shifted quite a bit from, you know, before it was, hey, sign this partnership agreement. We'll put, you know, it was a letter of intent to you build on our technology. Uh, and it was a co-marketing agreement. Of, hey, we'll promote you. You promote us. Right. Today, it's all about how do we actually um, actually use this technology? How do we actually get users and adoption, right? So it's really uh, good to hear you say that, Josh, because I'm just going to be really frank. A lot of it was just bullshit. A lot of it was uh, in, that I saw was, a lot, as you alluded to there, is some companies just trying to pro prop up their own value by having these very vacuous or very superficial partnerships when they really weren't doing anything with them. So that's why I did ask this. It sounds like, again, that gearing you are really focused on is usership. Um, and so harping back to that question, are these partnerships that you forge, were, were they real? You know, were there, were, was there value and meat in what you were both trying to do reciprocally? Um, I, I think it's a mixed bag, right? I think um, there's certainly some that are, have continued to develop and, and make good progress. Um, others have gone in a different direction and, and some were still very excited and bullish about. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a, a mixed bag and I think that's to, to be expected. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's just about where we're focused now um, you know, signing a letter of intent. Oh, thankfully, we we're past that, right? We can actually say, don't sign a letter of intent. Actually install this thing. Actually promote this thing. Actually use this thing. Uh, and that's a much better place to be. I think what we saw last year, this whole craze of raising millions of dollars on, on a white paper, that's the wrong approach. You don't, that's not how great companies are built. No. Um, you actually write software. You actually get users. You actually solve problems for real people. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm more excited about the space than ever. 
Um, and I think it's a lot of this correction is actually really healthy because uh, a lot of the behavioral side just didn't make a lot of sense, to, to be honest. Absolutely. So clearly there's a really positive projection for you and your team in the way in which you envisage the, the potential of this in the next few years. What's the last thing you want to add to all these discussions that we've had? Is there anything you wanted to do <clears throat> address to the community? Was there anything we perhaps missed, Josh, that you really want to bring to the fore? So the, the, the one big ask of everyone who's watching is go check out the DAP. Go see, what, go see what the future is going to be like, how you can buy and sell. Uh, if you have anything that you can put up for sale uh, on any type of marketplace, if you want to create your own marketplace, uh, or if you want to see what's available to buy, there's some really unique items for sale on our DAP uh, that you can't buy anywhere else. And so big ask is go check it out uh, and experience the future for yourself. Absolutely. You've heard it from Josh Fraser, one of the key members of the team. There's even merchandise. I've seen that of the Origin Protocols team. I mean, you can see Josh has been wearing some of it there, but there's a lot to be <laughs> said about the potential for marketplaces of the future. It's all about trying to change the game, change the frame of thinking for how we've seen marketplaces <clears throat> traditionally be centralized for a great, you know, for millennia, really, not just in this age we've seen with Google and, and Facebook emerge. So, Josh, thank you for trying to lead a protocol that's trying to do something different, change the narrative, and really build this out, not just this year, but it's a long-term game for you. You've got the money. You've explained that you're ready to go with the team to really focus on adoption. Let's see what you can do this year, and we'll talk, hopefully, in the next few months again. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. And thank you for your support, Brad. It's uh, really great to catch up. Likewise, mate. Thank you very much for your time. We'll talk soon. Take care.